Do you ever find yourself yearning to look beyond the obvious and dreaming about what's possible in your next chapter? Welcome to the Next Chapter Experience. I'm your host, Jeanette Blissett, former corporate executive who turned the page to become a best-selling author, entrepreneur, designer, and lifestyle business consultant. Episodes feature me and a kaleidoscope of guests who share their journeys with wit, candor, and humor, breathing life into real talks about things that matter most. I believe we all have a fire burning within us, waiting to be unleashed and shared with the world. It may just be a matter of time. So let's get together, turn the page, and get this adventure started. Welcome to the Next Chapter Experience. I'm your host, Jeanette Blissett, and today's guest is Mark Ashby. Mark is a crisis, culture, and high-performance specialist. He helps companies and senior executives develop a resilient and adaptive leadership culture so they can lead with confidence and perform at the optimum in any crisis. Mark, welcome to the Next Chapter Experience. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you very much, Janet, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Your background is so far and so wide and so deep. Okay, I'm going to allow you to share your background with our listeners. That's not the every everyday background, I suppose. I mean, essentially, I come from a, a surfing background. I, I grew up at the beach in Sydney. I was surfing by the time I was five years of age with my father, and that was my life. And it really is a big part of the whole culture here, and especially in Sydney. It's a real lifestyle. And I suppose I always had this bit of a fascination with the military for some reason. We always loved it. And I felt a bit lost going into my sort of 20s, my mid-20s, and turned around to my father one day and just told him I was thinking about joining the military and, and especially had this real fascination with the specialized units so i went and joined the army and you know, like i said much to my, my mum and dad's shock and a lot of my friends were very shocked coming from the beach and uh, it was one of the best decisions that i ever made and it, it really gave me amazing opportunities in life and uh, it took me to the operations i did in the army was with east timor and i went off to the middle east as a private contractor in 2004 and got embedded with the with your country's military did a bit of work there with the green berets and i was even did a bit of work with the state department over there and i was at one of your embassies for a couple of years living there in Iraq. And it was a it was an incredibly dangerous role over there, but it was a, an incredibly fulfilling role as well. And you only hear about the, the bad stories. You never hear about the good ones. And we did a lot of really good work over there and a lot of work that we could be proud of. And that then brought me back to Australia in 2016. And I ended up working for our government a bit out here, then working in corporate. I fell into corporate through a friend of mine's company. Funnily enough, ended up loving it. And it was something, a bit of a niche that I found there where I could use all my years of experiences and all the years of trial and error of what worked and what didn't work under sort of pressure situations and really give off all that experience to that sort of C-suite level, and which I really enjoyed. I really love it, to be honest, and giving me that ability to do boardroom talks and roundtable talks. And then I went off to university at 48 and finished off my master's degree, which was a, quite an experience at that age, <laughs> quite terrifying, to be honest. But it was a great decision that I really enjoyed my time there. And then I started my own business a couple of years ago, and that crisis high performance arena and i've never looked back and i really love it love what i do i noticed that you posted something on linkedin asking the question do you love what you do yeah. and, and apparently you do and the fact that you found a, a niche or a place where your skill sets could serve others especially at that higher level so i wanted to talk a little bit about that i, I think it's quite important in any business especially large scale especially if you have a business that's maybe in the public i did a lot of active shooter awareness talks or classes in the media in Australia for the big media companies with a couple of friends of mine and just teaching them basically what to do in the event of an active shooter. It's more about giving yourself a chance. That's what it's all about to making your mindset really understand what's going on to process it because everybody will panic. The average human being in that event of a weapon being discharged and the noise, it's so loud. We'll just go into absolute shock. And not yeah. as free. The whole thing that I teach is when to when to run, when to hide, and when to fight. And that's exactly your, what it was. That's your three elements. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's so simple, really, when you break it down. It's when should you run instead of running into a, a hail of bullets? Because quite often, if the whole crowd's running, maybe that's not the right thing to do. Maybe that's what the actual shooter has been planning all along. Especially if you have somebody with a bit of a tactical background, that could be quite terrifying. It's when to hide. What's around you? Do you have the ability to actually hide in your building? And you've got to look outside of the box. Do you have access to a roof? Can you get into the roof lining? 
things? Can you get yourself inside of something, some sort of a big storage box? Is there anything there that you can think outside of that that normality instead of just panicking, hiding behind a desk? And that's, I suppose, guys like myself that we really go into that whole process where we slow time down. It's an old sniper saying called slow is smooth and smooth is fast where you really slow time down to make that critical decision. And then finally, it's when you have to fight. You've got to fight for your life. You've got to, you've got to team up with your workmates. You've got to use any weapons at your disposal. And that can be anything. A weapon can be a forest imager or it can be a stapler. That can be anything that you can use together as a collective to actually take somebody down and keep yourselves alive. And that's what it's all about. It's about giving yourself a chance. Because if you just crawl into a ball in the corner, there's a big chance you're going to lose your life. And you're only here for one go. You want to give yourselves the best chance of seeing that through. Absolutely. <laughs> there's a quote that I, I wrote down. The quote is, it's hard to see a way out or define a path when you're consumed with fear. Yeah. And it's something you don't learn overnight to control that fear. It's something that takes time. I'll be the first to admit when we got to the Middle East, you know, I always got there and I fought the 2004 into Iraq and it, it was pretty terrifying. I think there wasn't one of us going into that environment that wasn't mixed with at least trepidation, if not fear. There was a very big chance that you could lose your life over there because people were losing their life every single day. It was the Wild West. And I think for once, the media really played it down. They actually really played down how bad it was. It was shocking. And like I said, it's something that it takes time to get your head around to really understand fear and to really, I'm not going to say embrace it, but to really understand your own capabilities in those situations when, and it can be anything like a motor vehicle accident or the car on fire. It can be anything like that really is going to challenge that part of your brain to adapt with crisis and that pressure and acting coolly under pressure. But it takes time to master, that's for sure. So when you're working with these leaders within these companies, we've been talking about like terrorist attacks and things of that nature with active shooters. But in the corporate environment, what are some of the issues that come up? You mentioned cultural change or maybe change management. What are some of the things that you are working with some of your clients on? Yeah, I think culture is a very big one. And it's got so many facets, culture, hasn't it? You've got your actual culture of people from a country, then you've got your actual culture in the workplace. And both of them gel together. You have people from different demographics and religions and races these days working together and it's no longer that in Australia like it was in the, the, the 70s or the 80s now we've got a massive multicultural society and it's about really gelling those together to get the best out of people and really understanding how you can really utilize people's skills in that workplace and to give people a chance you've really got to I think leaders have to get to know their people really take time to not sit in your office anymore get out on the floor and really meet your staff and understand them have lunch with them and it gives you that ability and i'm really enforce this with leaders you know, how often do you get out there on the floor and actually go and talk to your people and not just some little off the cuff talk every now and then to be seen really go and embrace them and understand them and find out who they are and what their families are about and the leaders like that and i work for some amazing leaders overseas in the middle east that really taught me that professionalism and empathy that work together and uh, absolutely amazing it really opened my eyes up to how leaders should behave because those leaders Janet you'll follow them and you'll do anything for them and and, I, and a really good one I say to a lot of these a lot of C-suite leaders do you want your people coming to work on a Monday morning and do you want them thinking about Friday afternoon on Monday morning or do you want them coming to work Monday morning and loving what they do because if you have those people with that mind and that cultural shift or change in your business the rest takes care of itself because your people will do anything for you and they'll work their backsides off. Yeah, I believe it. I have had my share of leaders, some good, some bad, but mostly some really good ones. And the best ones, the ones that I connected with were the ones who actually saw me as a person, got to know me, got to truly get into my head and, and established a really solid working relationship and a personal relationship with me. It was the leaders who were able to tap into my mindset and help to develop and grow and form some solid relationships are the ones and I've been out of that environment now for a bit. Yeah, and you remember them forever, the good ones, and you can really rattle them off because they make such an impact on you. And they just give you that they just give you that bit of rope as well to actually unlock what you're good at, to unlock unlock the staff there and actually instead of micromanaging them, actually yeah. use their skills and let them actually do what they are there to do. I was very blessed overseas and it really taught me that when I was working in the teams and I had my team and I was a team leader, but I had these amazing individuals around me and I learned over there to trust those operators to let them do what they were good at. And I just steered the ship. I didn't micromanage them. They all knew their roles they all knew their jobs what they were good at and it was like being 
and I know we'll go back to talking about sports teams. It was like being in an elite sports team every day. It was like being in the Yankees every day. And it was a pleasure to be part of, to watch that unfold and to grow over the years and how strong it became. It was a real testament to that team that hardly any of the guys left that team because it was so good to be part of. And I really try and bring that into the corporate sphere of really use your teams that you've got there and let them actually, like I said, let them just be in control of their own little world there. And what they're good at, it's going to work wonders with inside of your business. There's no, no doubt about that and I found I was the happiest when I was spread my wings and even developed some skill sets that I may not have had initially but did enough development to own it and those leaders who allowed me to do that were the ones that I just really appreciated but I had so much fun so as a team leader I wanted to emulate the same thing so I allowed my team members to do the same thing and they were happy I was happy we were just a great team loved it but every now and then I would step out the box of what a leader might think my responsibility was, and then I would get get back in that box. And I hated that, to be quite frank. I hated that. I said, I'm a very capable person. Why can't I do this? That was a bit of the, the struggle. But I know that you've said that getting troubled or divided teams working together to perform is really what you do in cases where the teams aren't really on the same page, let's just say. I'm aware of this diamond methodology that you use. You want to talk a little bit about that? It was really born out of a team when I was in Iraq that I was given. And my boss at the time over there, great he said, mate, I've got this team and it's a fractured team. It's basically split in the middle and it's half of the guys are from one style of unit and the half from the other. And in the military, you have great divide in the units. They don't always get along. And when you put them together, it sometimes doesn't work that well. And even though it was in the private sector, those old traditions still carried through. So I was given the, the role of basically working out what was wrong with these great young lads to, to get them together. I had a time frame. I was told you've got a couple of months to get these guys together. Otherwise, they're all going to be fired and lose their very well-paying tax-free jobs. And I'll just go to another team and take another team over. But I soon worked out that the problem wasn't the guys. It was their old team leader. He was the problem. He had really brought this toxicity into that team. And he'd favoured his half of the team versus the other side that weren't his from his original unit. And it was just creating all these problems. And they were so angry and bitter at each other. And as soon as I worked out that was the nuts and bolts of the problem, the guys, it was almost over a week that they came together. I got them all in one-on-one. -on -one. I got them in and talked to about what was going on and found out what the issue was and basically laid the law down to them in a good way and told them that you've got this amazing opportunity here and what we're doing here in part of history, you can either get on board with it or you can all go home and lose your job. So when I came back into Australia in the corporate world, I developed this diamond methodology and it's all about removing the basically emotion out of big decisions. So you may have somebody in C-suite that has got quite a crucial decision and I help them to remove that emotion. So don't act on looking to replace somebody in that business who's quite crucial with one of your buddies. Maybe that is the best decision. Maybe that person you're putting in there, one of your one of your buddies is a great one, but maybe don't look at that guy. Maybe look at that lady down the hall who is more qualified, who's been here longer and does a better job and look at your people, look at the skills they have. Because every single decision we make in life, Janet, it's based on negative and positive connotations, whether we like it or not. Everything we do, we look at one thing in a positive aspect and we discard the negative, how it affects that. But when you do break it down, it's quite incredible. And that's how we run our teams overseas. We will motion out to let ourselves arrive at a really sensible and correct decision to help us going forward. And, and I've been using that for a while now. It's amazing when you really explain it to a CEO or a CFO, look, that decision you've made, sure, you're looking at all the positive points of the decision, but are you looking at the negative? Are you looking at the person who's coming to replace that individual that's left? Are you looking at the hole that was created? That person that left, they owned all of the contracts here and all the tenders. Who's actually going to be replacing that person? So you've got to look at both sides of the coin. And that's the end of the nutshell. It's very simple. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. So you're dealing with companies, not only in your country, but globally. Do you see a major difference when you work with the companies in the United States versus the other C-suite and senior executives that you work? I find in the States, this is a quite a positive thing. They're quite proactive. I love that whole preemptive mindset. I find that a little bit more on the States. It can be the population. It can be the maybe the economics of it. I'm not really sure. But in Australia, it's a little bit more reactionary. Let's wait till it happens. We're getting better. But I think in the States, they're quite good at actually really understanding, especially with that whole business mindset. Europe's the same. Europe's very much like that as well. Very innovative. And not just innovative with technology, just innovative in the workplace. Yeah, looking outside the box, how they can improve the maybe day-to-day -day experience for their staff as well. And I'm finding that's changing quite a lot as well. That's definitely a big one in core. 
corporate where people are now coming into roles, this younger generation, with expectations now of what the perks are of that role. And a lot of the time, the money may be good, but they're like, okay, do I get gym membership with that role as well? And this is what they're doing now. It's quite a, quite fascinating. We have quite a history of leaders who have done it and done it well and have proven themselves and the outcomes are very successful companies and successful individuals with that as the path or the just the framework. We spend a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of resources in developing our leaders here in the States. I've lived in several states and have been moved several times for corporate moves. When I did an inventory of my books, the greatest number of books I had were books on leadership. Yeah, books. and that's a really good point. And I think in the States, they really promote that. Leadership is really front and center. And it's like an expectation of a lot of organizations there to develop in leadership. Where in Australia, it's getting much, much better now. But I think it was a little bit of a, a bit of a stop stop gap there for a while. I think, if anything, the pandemic has really enhanced that. I think it's really made a lot of leaders realize they have to change their ways. The things aren't going to be the same and they've got to adapt and they've got to be innovative with their workforce moving forward. So for that side of it, yeah, I think, that, like I said, the pandemic has really woken that up in Australia. But I think in the States, it's, yeah, it's already oh, front it's, center. It's definitely changed the whole culture of the work, though I'm no longer in the corporate work environment. In talking to some of my former colleagues, they all have had to make adjustments as to how they relate to, I'm just going to put it this way, the lack of control from the standpoint of having visibility and physicality with your workers being inside the office or working in a remote location. And that in itself was daunting for a lot of those leaders and also for the employees as well. Because they were trying yeah, to make that yeah. adjustment to how many meetings do we have? How many Zoom meetings do we have? How many accountability meetings do we have? And they were driving their employees nuts with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's highlighted maybe that how many meetings that are actually highly unnecessary. <laughs> Most and, of them are. And I say to a lot of <laughs> leaders, what, why are you having so many meetings? What, what, what are these meetings about? Wouldn't you be best spent having a day without without meetings or like cutting those meetings in half? Because you, you just don't need to have so many meetings and it's so stressful. And am I on time? What meetings next? It's just ridiculous. And I think the good leaders really work around that. that they work around whole- it, but they have a sense of awareness to your point. And they have some discernment in the value of time. One of the biggest, I would say, complaints that my former colleagues have had is that leaders felt a great need for a high level of accountability in their minds. Accountability was having the meetings, the Zoom meetings, where you have to be on camera and it was several times throughout the day. So it was contrary to the way I worked, which was to have a conversation, lay out the expectations, be available should you need me and uh, reach out, have a touch base. And if everything's going well, keep it moving. But other leaders coming in felt like they had to overcompensate for yeah. the lack of having that employee physically there and also overcompensate because they were new leaders. One of the biggest complaints was the number of meetings to plan the meeting, then a meeting to plan the meeting to plan the meeting. It's completely uh, You wonder if a lot of it's justification for their roles. Me too. And we used to have a, a thing overseas like that where a lot of uh, military leaders used to walk around with a, a folder in their hands. And we used to all joke about it. Here they go again with a folder looking important. That's what are you actually doing? They're probably going to have lunch you know, with their folder. We used to have a lot of these meetings overseas exactly the same and we just got to a point and where it was like well, why are we having so many meetings we don't need to have them we can knock this all in the head in that one meeting and corporate is no different it's exactly the same it all has direct correlations and you're, you're so right how did you get anything done how no, nothing is done. done you can't even do the work that you're called to do because they're meeting upon meetings upon meetings yeah. it's completely ridiculous but i did have a question for you though you're there where you are and you're dealing with companies worldwide, globally, how are you actually conducting your business and how much travel is involved with what you do? Yeah, obviously the last few years, it's been like everybody else. It's all been remote, remote learning and remote teaching. I'm all on Zoom. And it's something that I suppose people have had to get used to. For me, it's not so bad because I've dealt with this sort of stuff for years. And so I was quite okay with it. Even the isolation part of it, we were all isolated for years overseas and living in horrible conditions, living in shipping containers sometimes. And so yeah. for us, we just readjusted to that quite easily. But for the average person, it's hard. That I'm finding now, especially in Australia, yeah, it's all coming back to normal pretty much now. I'm like going to the city now and it's people out and about. And look, human beings, as much as some people love to have that ability to work at home, 
humans still have to have that interaction. There's nothing better than sitting down with somebody and having a coffee or having something to eat and having a chat with that person if it's about business, whatever it is. So that's really start, starting to actually come back to the normal. And I'd love looking more into next year to be able to start heading back overseas, even heading to the States or to the UK and doing some work over there, which would be great. I love it personally. I love that human interaction. That's where I can, I suppose, my magic, that's where I'm best suited in that one-on-one environment. It definitely has morphed into more of a hybrid situation where I would even look forward to it where there's maybe two days of the five days in the office and three days working remotely. So you can get stuff done. I remember my team would say, oh my gosh, I got to find a private office. I can get something done because we had these open floor plans. And anytime anyone walked by, there was chit chat and conversations. And my team would actually find a vacant office where they could get work done. So many of them are finding that they get a lot of work done at home, but are you ready for this? They missed each other. So therefore that hybrid situation would be perfect and is perfect for those employees. Yeah, I think that's a great one. And I think really, you wonder what hasn't happened years ago. It's just taken this giant shock to our system to make us realize that, <laughs> hey, why can't we do this easier? Why not work it? How great. I can work at home Monday, Tuesday, and go the Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. Who cares? And as long as you said you're getting it done, you, you, you're actually there maybe a couple of days a week, then why not make it work? Oh, I think it's a great idea. And the leaders that adapt to that and improvise moving forward are going to be the ones that have happy staff and are right. going to be productive and financially keep rolling on. And that's what it's all about. I would 100% agree with that. I really do. So I wish them the best and hopefully they can make that happen where it's a hybrid situation. It sounds like that's what's going on right now, at least for some of my former colleagues. But I really hope there's a higher level of appreciation for those who are set up at home to be highly productive. Not everyone is. And that's probably what the gray area is because not everybody has the home environment that would lend itself to business. So that's the other side of the coin. So you have to make sure that an employee has that type of environment at home to get work done. And I think that was a little bit of the quagmire for a lot of companies. So it was an adjustment for everyone. It was an adjustment, yeah, yeah. no doubt. Absolutely. So, so as you consider the road ahead, maybe things loosen up a little bit and you can have business trips to some of your clients. How often would you be coming to the States, do you think? Oh, I think in an ideal world, I'd love to be over there maybe a couple of times a year. That's what I'd love to be able to do. Probably at nice times of the year. When I was over there with the government years ago, I was over in Chicago on and off for the best part of a year and experienced the winter in Chicago. And I was like, oh my God, I was so shocked at how cold it was. I've been to the snow in Canada, I've been to the snow in Europe. Nothing was as cold as my mind. That was so cold. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I had such a great time. They looked after us like I can't speak highly enough of how good they were to us over there. But yeah, I'd love to be able to go over there maybe a couple of times a year and a couple of times to maybe to the UK as well. So that'd be that'd be fantastic. Very good. I understand that you have a master class that you are offering. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a free master class on my website and it's very simple. It's markashbeconsulting.com and it's, like I said, it's a master class and it just gives your listeners a, a bit more of an idea of how I can help them. I'll explain my domain methodology, a little bit more explanation and how that works and that whole business model. And I think it's important that you have master classes that, like I said, people can just go and they don't have to worry. Some people don't always like talking to you face to face that they might want to go and check you out first, what you're about and what your personality is, what you can deliver, what you can offer them. There's a lot of different people out there selling products these days and selling themselves. And a lot of these leadership experts, I suppose I'll just bring something that's a little bit different. I'm going to be that bit different and having a bit of a different background. So yeah. Yeah, that's what my masterclass is all about. So as you consult, what does it look like in terms of your services or consulting that you are offering your executive or corporate clients? Are there packages or what does that look like? Yeah, generally, Janet, I'll go in and I'll work with them leaders from the board level up to the CEO as individuals. So I'll go and do little packages with them. Generally, it's only going to be three months or six months. If you're working with somebody individually for four weeks, you're wasting their time and you're wasting your own. It's got to be something where it's a bit of a buy-in. They may be in a bit of a bad spot in life, a professional, bit of a bind. And my job is to go in there and really help them get through that. And like I said, using all my years of experience to really flip their paradigm a bit and make them really believe who they are, get that confidence back and what they're good at. I'll also go and do actual day master classes with with corporate teams, but I really love doing the same thing, the extended, you know, coaching packages, like you said, that maybe go for sort of six to eight weeks. That's whether you're going to get the best out of it. And I might go into that environment once a week for an hour and a half with that team and work with them. And a lot of, of course, has been on Zoom, but I find when you go into that environment as a human being, they get so much more out of it. And it's really amazing, like I said, just finding the, the real skills that those people have in that environment and really unpacking that and finding out what's going on with the business. If the business itself, the CEO buys into the whole process, it 
makes my life a lot easier because you've got that backing to go in there and really maybe ask the hard questions. And sometimes they don't want to hear the truth, but I think the truth is very important. And coming from my background, we're not as guys or and girls like myself, we're not as frightened to actually go into a CEO's office and tell them the truth. Mm-hmm. I've worked with four-star generals. I've worked with leaders of countries. I've worked with my prime minister, and I've even met with one of your presidents a couple of times. And but to us, it's like they're all human beings. They all then bleed. And that's my attitude towards it. I just want to go there and get the best out of that individual. And, and they want to know you're going to be by their side. They want to know that you're going to be through that with them and almost really hold their hand. And that's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. And uh, like I said, that's what I love to do. I really tailor my whole business model. I've got a whole bunch of lessons from my background. I think I've got about 44 lessons in total. And I tailor those lessons to suit that company or the individual. I can really pluck my lessons from all my modules and really tailor it to that person, and which is so you get the best out of them. Absolutely. So let me ask you this question. You brought something to mind in terms of telling the, the CEOs the truth. And I just wonder if their perception of whatever the issue is in their company, they have a certain perspective of it. Okay, this is what I think the problem is. This is what we're trying to solve. And then you go to the employees or let's just say the team, the higher level team, and they have a different perspective. How do you bring the two together? And that happens, I think, more often than not, because people talk. And I think one thing that we've all got our skills in life, and I think that something I've realized that I'm good at, I'm good at getting the truth out of people. I'm really good at getting that bit of trust out of people and they feel they can really tell me what's going on and without them being dumped in it themselves. And they always talk all the time. They'll tell me what's going on. It doesn't take long. It's like a canary. As soon as it starts singing and that's, it all comes out. And like you said, you'll go there to the whoever you're dealing with, whether it's HR or the CEO direct. And they're like, this is what the problem is. And I'm like, actually, you've got maybe 20% of it right. And the rest, this is what's going on. But you've got to go in there really understand the problem. You can't just go in there willy-nilly saying, oh, I think this is a problem. You've got to, this is what the problem is. I've spoken to all your staff, your managers, and this is what's going on. This is where the unhappiness lies, or this is where the productivity is being affected because you're not listening to these people. It can be, it can be anything that's affecting productivity. It can be the silliest thing in, in marketing or like I said, or in HR. And unless you identify that, you're just going to keep having the same problems. And I say, got me here for a reason. You brought me, something's not going on. Please let me turn that around for you. And sometimes it needs that external voice to actually make them realize, hey, this is what's going on. And it's okay to acknowledge it. It's okay to fail. We all learn from our mistakes. We made terrible blunders overseas to become experts in what we did. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I say it to a lot of leaders because I said, even the biggest, brightest leaders on this planet, they all have uh, insecurities, Janet. They all have their own little quirks and issues. And I've seen it. Uh, and I've had one of our big leaders in Australia who was going through a, a bad time in his life, but family problems. And once you identify that and really bring it forward and, and acknowledge it, then you can start from day one from scratch and you can start building it up again. That's so, amazing. Yeah, it's interesting. Absolutely, absolutely. Your background is so fascinating and your application of your experience was of interest to me, especially in these days and times when things are happening around us. And we talked offline about the incident in Texas in the Uvalde school and the outcome of that with the firing of the police chief. And what came to mind was you and the work that you do and how applicable it would be to a situation as it relates to developing individuals from a leadership perspective, because it seems like that there was a breakdown in leadership and communication. Yeah, from an outsider point of view, and I'll make that really clear, I wasn't there and not part of the breakdown down and how the tactical side of it all went down. But it seemed like there was a yeah, a real breakdown, I'd say, in leadership, communication, maybe too many different elements in there. I noticed and something that would the guys like myself will pick up on the different uniforms involved. There's so many different types of uniforms involved in that situation. And that's going to create confusion straight away because these units, they won't work or train together. I can guarantee that 100%. You're going to have tactical guys and then you're going to have your local police. And then it was, yeah, it seemed like a real, a bit of a quagmire. And like I said, I can't comment too much on it, but it was very tragic chain of events for that person to lose their job over it now. There must have been massive public pressure and public outcry about what they felt went wrong. And I can only speak from how we would do with something like that. I suppose when there's kids involved, you've just got to go. That's it. Yeah. No ifs, no buts. You've got to go. You've got to do something. If we have a saying where it's, you're better off doing something than doing nothing. And we lived by that sort of saying overseas for many years on the job. And you don't want regrets. You've got to go home and look yourself in the eye after that day and remember what you did or what you didn't do. And you're going to be judged by your community, by your peers and by yourself and what you do. But the families that lost those children 
and lost a mother or father. It's just tragic. It's a tragic and it's a situation that's been happening too frequently here in the U.S. So hopefully we'll see an end to those kind of tragedies. All right, Mark, as we start to wrap some things up, what's next for you? What's on the horizon for you? Yeah, just to keep growing. And I just, I love working with, I suppose, individuals, Janet, that, that really want to, if you want to call those people in that high performance bracket, I really love that because they want to be better and they want to be at that level of high performing. I know what it's like to be at that level. I worked at that level of high performing for a long time and it's a hard road to get there. It's even harder to maintain it and stay at that level and to be professional every day in what you do. So that's something I really love and to get myself traveling again, which would be fantastic. And that's always a big one that I love doing and meeting new people. And yeah, just to be, and I know it's a bit of a cliche, just to be happy what I'm doing every day. I'm very fortunate that I love what I do. I can really use my years of experience and just to keep growing on that road. So how can our listeners contact you? They're nice and simple, very similar to my website. So it's just mark at markashbyconsulting.com. That's Mark with a K. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, nice and simple. If your listeners want to drop me a line and have a conversation with me, I'll get back to them nice and promptly and it's, I'm here all the time. Okay, that sounds great. So what I'll do is I'll put that in the show notes as well as your in link in the show notes as well as a way to reach out to you. And I certainly have enjoyed our conversation. But again, Mark, I appreciate your time that you've given a next chapter experience. Thanks so much. And I look forward to keeping up with you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, Janet. Thanks very much for having me on the show. It's, it's been really fun talking to you. Okay, same here, same here. Ways to connect with Mark are via his website, markashbyconsulting.com or via email directly at mark at markashbyconsulting.com. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Next Chapter Experience. If you have already subscribed, rated, and left a review, or shared this podcast with a friend, many, many thanks. For questions, comments, or feedback, reach out to me at Jeanette Wissett at nextchapterexperience.com. We'll be back with more conversations, so until then, keep that fire burning.